Welcome to the podcast for Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation, and our world. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just as Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, Who does this young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is a Moabite who came from the Mo- from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the woman who who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along with, after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over, and she got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men, Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it'll be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz, to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Why don't you pray with me as we start this morning? Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for being here with us today. We hope us to know you more clearly as we read your word, and if you look at who you are in today's passage. Lord, would you remind us who you are today? Would you remind us that you are the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, Lord. May your word speak to us, speak to our circumstances and speak to who you are this morning. Speak, Lord. We're listening. Amen. 
Hey, it's uh, great to be here with you this morning. Uh, As Brad said, uh, I'm Ben, and I'm the youth pastor here at our Mackenzie campus, and it is a joy being the youth pastor of all the uh, wonderful, amazing youth that we have a part of this church. Uh, You know, it's been a difficult uh, season uh, for us as a church and and for us as a youth ministry at times. You know, we're going through uh, church online and youth having to wear masks and all that sort of stuff, but we have continued to see God's faithfulness uh, and goodness. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we heard uh, the story of Shayla as she was in the baptismal telling the story of all God has done in her life, particularly over the last 18 months to two years. And uh, it has just been a privilege to see uh, that God is still doing amazing things in our young people uh, in this ministry uh, as well. It's been uh, a real privilege. But hey, this morning, I want to uh, start by telling a story. And Haley, don't worry, I'm not like the other Baptist pastors. This will go somewhere, I promise, okay? But uh, I want to start by taking you back to May 2019 before the pandemic, because this story has me and my wife returning from a trip to America. Remember when that wasn't a novel idea? And uh, we'd been over there for a couple of weeks, uh, really enjoying ourselves, catching up with some friends, going to some conferences, doing all the good things, exploring America. And uh, we came home 5 a.m. in Brisbane after, you know, the stupidly long 14-hour overhaul, long-haul flight kind of thing. And uh, we get home just after 6 to the realization that our house has been robbed. See, in the 24 hours between our house sitter leaving and us coming home, someone had got in. Taken a couple of laptops, taken a couple of phones, and taken our Dyson vacuum cleaner. (laughs) Yeah, they left the PlayStation but took the Dyson. (laughs) And we eventually came to realize they also had taken both of our cars. Yeah. It was a pretty terrible feeling to come home to. We just had a fantastic holiday and all of a sudden we're on the phone to the police, you know, putting in all the details about our cars and getting them to come over so that we can put in an insurance claim and they're dusting the place for fingerprints and they're tracking our credit cards now. We're also cancelling our credit cards, calling insurance. It was chaos. And amidst all of this, the thing that was most concerning for me was the cars. See, I may look like the manliest man on the Gateway Pastoral team because of my beard and tattoos and general muscles. But uh, (laughs) when it comes to cars, I have no idea. I hate them. Basically, all I know is that they have a fan belt and they have an accelerator and a brake. Uh, And in my car, it's a foot brake, which I had to learn uh, all about. But I don't know much about cars at all. And so the concept, the idea, the reality that I was going to have to buy at least one new car, maybe two, was horrific. And particularly for my wife and I, because as we called our insurance company, they said, look, we'll give you a car because your car's been stolen as part of your insurance policy. I'm like, thank you so much. For 10 days, we'll cover it for you. And then you'll have to foot the rest of the bill yourself. And so we're kind of sitting there going, let's get this done in 10 days. And uh, it was one of those moments, I've, I've never prayed so hard as in that period of time trying to go, God, we need a car, but God, would you just help us in the midst of this? Because we're praying prayers like, God, we need the insurance to come through so that we have extra, all this extra money to buy these cars, God. We need the police report to come through quickly. We need all of these things to just happen so that we can go and buy a car, and I'm hating this experience. This, for me, was probably one of those like 10-day periods where I was most praying these, like, I need you, God, prayers. You're like, I need you, God, to come through because I don't think I can do this myself. I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know how to manage this. I need you, God. And I don't know where you are this morning, but chances are, at some point in your life, you've either been in a season where you've been praying, I need you, God, prayers, or you here this morning are praying, I need you, God, prayers. You know, maybe for you, it's you see how much money is coming in each month and you look at the cost of everything that's about to happen. And let's be real, Christmas is like 41 days away in the next month. 
and you go, we got mortgage payments, we got groceries, I mean, fuel prices are meant to hit $1.93 or something stupid, and I've got to buy Christmas presents and all of that. Or maybe it's not your personal finances, but your business. You know, you're looking again at the accounts, how much you've got sitting in the bank, and you're looking at your wages that you've got to pay, and you're going, there's a gap here. I need you, God. It could be you're experiencing the loneliness of the loss of a loved one, whether that's uh, in a whole variety of different ways, but you remember what you had. And you know you want that again, but you're just not sure that you can put yourself out there like that. You're in this moment of feeling alone and wanting to connect, but not feeling like you have the strength or the resolve to do it. God, I need you. Or maybe it's the gap between where your kids are and where you would like them to be. Maybe it's where they're at spiritually. Or maybe it's what's going on within your family. And you're asking, God, can you really bring my kid back to faith in you? God, can you really restore my family? God, I need you. And as we ended chapter one last week in the uh, book of Ruth, this is kind of where we find ourselves in the I need you God moment. The book of Ruth, chapter one, is not a happy ending story. Basically, everyone dies. You know, Ruth's husband dies, Naomi's husband dies, the other woman, Oprah's name, a uh, husband, she, he dies. You know, they have no sons, and then Oprah leaves, and then it's just Ruth and Naomi, and they go back and they're like, we have nothing and no one. And Jason explained it really well last week that these women, by having no husbands, and no sons, have no source of income, have no rights, have no protection, have no one advocating for them, no one helping them, and it seems that they don't even have any family. So they just go back, see what happens. But I can imagine, as they're going back, Ruth and Naomi are praying, I need you, God, prayers. So much so that we can actually see that for Naomi, she doesn't just need God, she's wrestling with God. She both needs God, but at the same time doubts God is even going to come through. Chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, it says this, Naomi says, Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She's in this place where she both simultaneously needs God but doubt God is even going to come through for her because her current experience seems to suggest otherwise. That in fact, if anything, maybe God is punishing her, neglecting her. And she, I'm sure, has a myriad of reasons, maybe starting with the fact that she left the nation of Israel and went to live in Moab, which is a God-forsaken nation in Israel thought. To imagine that maybe God has run out of grace, love, care, and a willingness to provide for her anymore. And that's often the reality that we sit in. When we find ourselves in the I need you God moments, it's very easy for us to also at the same time have doubts about God's willingness to provide for us at all. You know, you may wonder, God, are you done with me? Have I asked once too often? Maybe he's sick of me. He loves me, but will he really come through for me? Maybe it's I've been waiting for so long, has he forgotten me? These questions, feelings, and I need you God moments always come back, not necessarily to God's power, but the question of God's character and heart for his people, for you and I. And today we get to jump into Ruth 2, which I think has a lot to say about God's character and heart for us in these moments. In fact, Ruth chapter 2 is great because it is the beginning of the happy ending that this story is longing for. And as we started chapter 2 today, I don't know if you noticed, but the author of this book just foreshadowed a little bit. Just Ruth chapter 2 verse 1, it has this little moment where it pauses and it tells us about this guy named Boaz. He's the guy that we need to keep an eye out for. The author wants us to know, hey, as you're reading this, just get, get ready. This Boaz guy is coming. Keep an eye out for him. See when he enters the story. And then immediately turns back to Ruth. Now, Ruth and Naomi are trying to figure out how they're going to provide for themselves. And Ruth has this idea that she's talking to Naomi about, about going out and uh, 
just going to the harvest field, going to uh, people's fields and gleaning some grain from what's left over. Now, in doing this, we may not realize, but Ruth is making the most of a law that God had provided for his nation of Israel, basically God's welfare system. This is what the rule is that uh, Ruth is taking advantage of, and it's found in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9 to 10, we see that God says this to his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners. I am the Lord your God. Now Ruth in this story is both poor no husband, no sons, just her and her mother-in-law, which sounds very poor, and a foreigner. She's both of those things. And as she heads out, she asks that she would find favor, provision, and a place to work. Because while this is a law that God has instituted for his nation, very few people at the time, as Jason said last week, the judges, there was not a good period in the nation of Israel. They were not following God's law very well at all, where people were following or instituting this. Not many people were doing this at all. Hence why she's asking for provision and favor. But in this moment, Ruth teaches us a very important principle about what we should do and the position and posture we should have when we wait, when we find ourselves in these I need you God moments and we have to wait for his provision to come through. See, she shows us that we can't sit passively and wait for it to fall into our lap. See, for Rachel and I, we had to go and buy a car, right? And if I said to you, for those 10 days, Rachel and I prayed morning, midday, afternoon, night, like we prayed every meal, and I tend to eat six meals a day, you know, like we prayed at every single meal, and some, you'd be like, wow, that's, that's a really great thing for you to do, right? It's the right thing you should do. But if I then told you, but then we proceeded to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and Stan and Apple TV, and we just relaxed and took it real easy, knowing that God was going to provide, would you be shocked If at the end of 10 days I said to you, guess what? God didn't come through with the goods. No car randomly drove into our driveway with a person in it who threw us the keys. You know, like, what is going on? Where is God's provision? No, you wouldn't think that because you'd be like, that's stupid, that's lazy. What are you doing? Instead, you know full well that for us to find the car that God was going to provide us with, we had to be actively involved in the process ourselves. And we were, you know, we ended up test driving cars, asking questions, calling our mechanic friend, we scoured websites, apps, we asked friends if they knew anyone, and we even went to used car lots and talked to used car salespeople. Yeah, we were that desperate. And eventually we did get a car, just to clarify, we did get a car, right? But St. Augustine says it like this, when he's talking about this idea of what do we do when we're in these moments and we're waiting for God to come through? He says this, he says, pray as though everything depends on on God, but work as though everything depends on you. See, Ruth is a reminder that as we pray and wait for provision, we are also to work and be actively involved in the process. And as we see Ruth taking steps to provide for herself, already in these first few verses, we can begin to see God's provision for her too. See, in Ruth chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, it says, So she went out, entered into a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. Now remember, she's gleaning, which is only happening because God has instituted a rule that they are meant to leave the gleanings behind. See, God had created a rule that Ruth was able to use to provide for herself. We think Ruth is just providing for herself but it's already a part of God's provision. He knew that there would be people just like Ruth who would need this. So what did he do? He provided a rule that would facilitate that for them. So as it turned out though, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you and the Lord bless you, they answered. Now, there are two phrases that we need to stop and take notice of in these two verses. And the two phrases are this, as it turned out and just then. 
Both of these phrases are trying to force us, as the reader of this passage, to ask a question. Is this a coincidence? Or is there something more at play? See, the word that we translate as it turned out is mikra, which is used to describe something happening by chance, what we would call a coincidence. And the writer doesn't just do it once. Notice how he says, just then, as if just then, the timing, look at that, what a coincidence. Boaz arrives just then too. So as it turns out, she's in Boaz's field, and just then Boaz appears? Another coincidence. But the author is trying to get us to ask this question. Do we believe in coincidence or do we believe in providence? The simple way of understanding this idea of providence is this. Do we believe in coincidence or do we believe that God is at work? Do we believe that God is moving in our lives? Do we believe that God is providing in our lives? See, talking about this idea of coincidence, William Temple, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, says this, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. Do you believe in coincidence or providence? And this is the question that the author wants us to grapple with. What do we say when these kind of things happen to us? To go, wow, that was lucky. Oh, what a coincidence that we bumped into you here. Because what we see in these opening verses is this truth. Often what we consider a coincidence is actually God's providence. And the author is going, if you can get your head around this, that the coincidences in our lives are very often the provision of God, then you are gonna be blown away at what you're gonna see next. See, let me introduce you to Boaz. See, Boaz, as a name, it kind of has the, the, the term strength attached to it. They would often translate the word Boaz as strength. In fact, one of the pillars in the temple is actually called Boaz. It's like the Lord is the strength, right? So Boaz is strong. Like, I can imagine he can bench well over 100 in the gym. Like, he's a strong guy, right? But he's actually not strong physically. He may be. But the reason... Boaz is attached to is is his name is because this idea of strength of character is attached to him. See, Boaz is considered a morally right man. He's a good man, you know. He's He's a guy of good integrity and good character, a reliable guy that you can really trust. Boaz is a reliable guy. He's a good man. But Boaz greets his workers with this phrase, and it seems, again, insignificant, but none of it is. He says this, the Lord be with you, and they respond with, the Lord bless you. It's subtle, but most biblical commentators note that this interaction is not just speaking to Boaz's moral character, but his spiritual integrity as well. The Boaz isn't just a good man, he's a God-honoring man. And we see that actually he's keeping the law, he's leaving the edges of his field, he's letting Ruth glean and he's embedding a God-honoring culture amongst his workplace. Boaz is a man of moral and spiritual integrity. And in verse 5, Boaz, as he is surveying his land, notices Ruth. He notices a woman gleaning the edges of this field and that she isn't with the other women workers. And very clearly for him, he can see she is either poor or foreign or both. But by noticing her, something happens. Because he's noticed her, he can decide if he wants to do something. And he does. So he inquires about her, finds out a little bit more about her story. And because of that, he walks over to her and dresses Ruth herself. All because he noticed her. Now, everything that happens from this point on in the story... Now, I'm not just talking about chapter 2. I'm talking about chapter 3 and chapter 4. Everything else that happens in this story is because he noticed her. See, provision can only happen when things are noticed. 
When we notice people and we notice problems, the invitation to provision begins. So everything else that happens in this story happens because Boaz notices Ruth. In verse 8, it says, Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jar the men have filled. Again, what we miss here is that for many of the foreigners, Ruth, um, when she's talking to Naomi later, addresses it. And Naomi says, stay with Boaz's people because if you go to another field, you may be harmed. But the poor and the foreigners who are gleaning and walking around the edges of these fields were always at risk of being harassed, attacked, and abused by the owners and the workers of those fields. If these people didn't want them stealing their grain, it was their land. They were within their rights to go and do so, even though they were breaking God's law. And this was a real possibility. Anytime Ruth would go and do this, anytime anyone would go and do this, it wasn't just that I hope they let me take a few bits of grain. It was like, I hope they won't attack me, abuse me, assault me. If they just harass me, I'll get off pretty well. Boaz is aware of this practice, though, and desires to keep Ruth safe, not expose her to that risk anymore. So he goes and tells her about his boundaries, the field where the men work, and he tells the men not to lay a hand on her, and he tells her to walk with the women. And so he gives Ruth permission to work in his fields. But more importantly, Boaz actually institutes the first anti-sexual harassment policy in the workplace. There you go, genuinely, do not lay a hand on her. And we actually see that the provision has started because Boaz is beginning to provide protection for Ruth. See, that is an act of provision. But the provision continues in verse 14. We see again, they have a bit of a conversation, but it picks back up at mealtime, most likely lunchtime, one of my favorite meals of the day. Boaz says to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. Now, I'm a dip guy, but I'm probably more a French onion guy than a wine vinegar guy, because that sounds gross, but she did it anyway. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. See, Boaz is inviting her in. She's sitting with the workers. She's eating with Boaz and the workers. She's being invited in. She eats all she wants and leftovers. See, Boaz doesn't just give her something. Oh, here's a little something to tide you over until the end of the day. Boaz gives her everything she needs and more. He actually is willing to waste food on her. See, leftovers are a waste. They're just sitting there now. They're not going to be consumed, but they've been prepared. It's a waste. He's willing to waste food on her, a Moabite woman who he has just met that morning. It speaks to the generosity of Boaz, that he would do something like this for someone like that. So Boaz generously provides for her, but he still isn't done. The provision continues. We see that as Ruth gets up to go and glean again after lunch, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and do not reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she'd gathered and it amounted to about an ephah however you say that word, she carried it back into town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her the leftovers from before at lunch after she'd finished eating. See, this is an attitude for Boaz. Now, this isn't just like a couple of nice things. This is who Boaz is. He uses his power to make things easy for her. He leaves the stalks behind. He's giving her the prime grain, not just the stuff around the edges, and he's giving her a lot of it. See, the amount that she's gathered, that ifah, which is about 13 kilograms worth of grain. In fact, the, the, the thing that they would use to put it all in normally to store it was about the size of a human person. You could fit a person inside there. That's how much grain she's got in one day. 
Now, I want to take a moment to just note how strong Ruth must have been to pick up 13 kilograms of grain and then throw it over her shoulder and carry it all the way back into town. Like, it's not like it was a small little walk. I would definitely not be up for that. So I don't think you'd want to arm wrestle Ruth. I think she'd be able to kill you. But Ruth starts the day with nothing, ends the day fully fed with leftovers, welcomed in to the working group and leaving with 13 kilograms of grain. All because of Boaz's generous provision. She hadn't had to pay a cent. In fact, if anything, there's so much grain there, they're going to sell it and make a profit from it. See, Boaz has gone above and beyond in his provision for Ruth and Naomi. And now I get why at every women's conference they tell you to wait for your Boaz. I get it. He's the man. You should wait for your Boaz because he's better than me for sure. I'm sorry, Rachel. But remember this. It wasn't a coincidence that Ruth ended up where she did. See, God had led her to Boaz. As it turned out, she was in Boaz's field. And just then, Boaz arrived. And God knew that Boaz would provide. See, Boaz is God's provision to Ruth and Naomi. But all of this, when Ruth gets back, causes Naomi to ask, who is the one who did this? Who showed you such generosity today? And when she finds out it's Boaz, she celebrates. Now remember, Naomi is the woman who just like genuinely 20 verses before was like, God hates me, God's taken everything from me, don't even call me Naomi Naomi anymore, like what a terrible name, call me Mara because I'm so bitter about what God has done to me. And now she celebrates. She even says, you know, bless Boaz, but she uses this phrase, uh, he continues to show his goodness to the living and the dead. The he in that sentence is referring to God. She's totally flipped. And why? Because Naomi realizes that God in his provision has not just given Ruth all the food she needs and some, has not just given them 13 kilograms of grain, but God has guided Ruth and Naomi to a relative to someone who qualifies, as the phrase read, as a guardian redeemer, a term that refers to someone in their culture who has the ability as a family member close enough to redeem any family members who were poor, oppressed, and enslaved, to buy them back from the situation that they were in, welcome them into the family, but also to say, I will take you in and I will provide for you. Boaz can redeem them. Boaz can save them from the situation that they're in. And all of a sudden, Naomi recognizes this isn't coincidence. This is providence. God is at work. God is moving. God is providing. See, the woman who a few days earlier was complaining about how God had made her life bitter, that he had emptied her life, that he had afflicted her life, that he had brought misfortune on her, was now actually recognizing that that God was not that at all, but he was the one who had shown his hesed, his kindness, his love, his loyalty towards them, that he was always inspired to act with compassion and mercy, that he had never stopped and he never will stop, that he is committed, that he is loyal, that he fulfills his promise, that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. That's who he is. And I want to say this to you this morning, if that is who God is to Ruth and Naomi, and if we truly believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then you need to hear that he is not Stop showing you his hesed, his kindness, his love and loyalty. That he is always inspired to act towards you with mercy and compassion. That he has never stopped providing for you and he never will stop providing for you. That he is committed, that he is faithful, that he will fulfill his promises and he is Jehovah Jireh to you too. He is the Lord who provides for you.
Do you believe in coincidence or providence? So the author at the start of this chapter, as I said earlier, foreshadowed Boaz and his appearance to get us excited for what he was going to show us through Boaz. See, Boaz is kind and generous, abundantly so. Also, it turns out that Boaz is a redeemer, a savior for Ruth and Naomi. And we get to stand here on the other side of Jesus and realize that Boaz is to Ruth as Jesus is to you today. See, Jesus is the greater Boaz. As much as I wish I was more like Boaz, Jesus is Boaz plus. He isn't just foreshadowing the author that Jesus will redeem us ultimately, but he is also foreshadowing the type of person that Christ will be when he comes and lives amongst us. He's not just showing what he will achieve, but he's showing how, the heart, the character behind how he will be amongst us, the type of provision that Jesus and God himself will, pre- will extend to us. See, if you look through Jesus' life and you just look at a couple of stories, you see it clearly. See, Jesus has an interaction with a woman who has been profusely bleeding for 12 years nonstop. She is cut off from her community. She's not allowed within the walls of the city, and if she does, she has to walk around yelling the phrase unclean so that people know to give her a wide berth. Nobody notices her. Nobody cares about her. She's ostracized, left out. Jesus walks through town one day. She decides, that's it, I'm done with this. She walks through the crowd and touches the hem of Jesus' cloak, healed instantly, right? And it says in the, in, the, in the story that Jesus notices the power go out from him. And he knows that someone has just been healed. And he doesn't just continue on being like, look at that, I can do it without even trying now. Look at that, my clothes heal people. You know, like he doesn't just move on. He stops. And he says, who touched me? Who touched me? This woman nervously comes forward because she's worried she's gonna get in trouble. As an unclean woman, she shouldn't have been walking through that crowd. Definitely not without saying she's unclean. Jesus stops and he says to her, my daughter, your faith has made you well, right? It's the only time in Jesus' ministry that he ever calls someone daughter. And Jesus, by bringing her into the middle of the crowd and recognizing her healing, is showing everyone else that this unclean woman is now clean. See, Jesus notices the power go out. And because he notices something, an opportunity happens for this woman to be welcomed back into community publicly. Jesus notices her. I want you to know this morning, Jesus notices you too. Even if you feel like what you're going through seems to have been dragging on for so long that he must have forgotten. Then we see another time a woman is brought before Jesus, caught in the act of adultery, thrown before him with a crowd that wants to stone her to death. Now they're trying to trap Jesus, but they're more than happy to kill this woman too. And Jesus responds to them, whoever is without sin cast the first stone. Slowly but surely they all walk away and no one is left there. Jesus asks this woman, Who condemns you? She says, no one. Says, good, go and live your life of sin. You know, forgive you, all that. Now, while we recognize the forgiveness that he's extended to her, the invitation to follow him, we also have to recognize that Jesus has literally saved this woman's life. He protected her from a mob of people that were trying to kill her and trap Jesus. See, Jesus protected her, and Jesus will continue to protect you too. Jesus then tells the parable of the prodigal son, a parable that is meant to describe us as the sons. You know, the wayward ones who run away, but also the righteous ones who stay, but ultimately are both ostracized from the father, who is God. We often refer to this parable as the prodigal son, but Tim Keller wrote this amazing book about the idea of it being the prodigal God. Because often when we think of the word prodigal, we think of the wayward coming home. But to be prodigal is also equally as much to be someone who gives and spends lavishly and foolishly, which the father in this story does. See, the son squandered half of their wealth. He even has the nerve to say, I wish you were dead so I could have your money. The father honors that request, and then the son goes and wastes it all away. 
And when the son comes back, how would you expect the father to respond? Well, this father responds with running, hugging, kissing, a ring, a robe, sandals, the fattened calf, a huge party that his son has returned. See, this father lavishly provides for his son. Even though his son has totally taken half of his wealth that he accumulated over his life and squandered it all, he still generously gives him more again. And as this father provides for his son, so Jesus will provide for you. Jesus, through his life, shows us his heart, which is ultimately the heart of God, and his heart is to be lavish in his provision. Ronald Reilheiser, talking about this concept, says this, God, as we see in both nature and in Scripture, is over-generous, over-lavish, over-extravagant, over-prodigious, over-rich, and over-patient. If nature scripture and experience are to be believed. God is the absolute antithesis of everything that is stingy, miserly, frugal, narrowly calculating, or sparing in what it doles out. God is prodigal. Dictionaries define prodigal as wastefully extravagant and lavishly abundant. God is prodigal. He is abundant and generous beyond our small fears and imaginations. See, this is the heart of God, to be your provider, not just to provide you with the bare minimum, but to lavish you with his provision. See, Rachel and I, we did eventually buy a car, keyword, a car, singular. I wish I could tell you it's because we were trying to be environmentally conscious and green and all that kind of stuff, you know. But actually, the practicalities just worked for us to buy one. We, at that time, lived in an apartment 200 meters from a train station that would take Rachel 200 meters from work. So we decided one car would be great, and I can drive that around, and Rachel can catch the train to and from work. It just worked for us. God provided. We were then given an opportunity to move to a place that was a lot more affordable and uh, had a few other things that we really wanted to, to have uh, in our place, and we said yes. God provided a new place. Part of the challenge moving to the new place, though, was it was not anywhere near as close to the train station right now. I think a 2.6 kilometer walk, so we had to have a conversation about that because it's a little bit more than 200 meters. And we decided that we would stick with the one car, right? We just weren't sure what we were going to do, but we had some conversation about different options. But when we moved there, we actually had two co-workers here, Brad and Danny, who lived in the area. And they generously offered, they said, hey, look, we know you're moving in the area. We'd be happy to give you a lift to and from work a couple of days a week. So that would be great. That would be so wonderful. Provision, right? Eventually, though, God decided to provide for Danny and Richo and Brad and Mercy, and they moved to wonderful houses that they bought, right? Great for them. Well done. Now I have to be <laughs> at home trying to figure out a lift to and from work. And I'd previously had a bit of a phase where I had... Uh, got into bike riding and uh, ridden to work a few times, but not, not too much. Uh, and I thought, maybe I could go back to that, but I'm still not sure how Jess and Lauren and Amelia, who I share an office with, would feel about me walking in in Lycra in the morning. I don't know if they would be super thrilled about that at work, um, and I'm not sure what the HR policy is on that either, but um, I didn't know what to do, right? We were arming and ahhing. There was another couple in our friendship group who kind of lived in the area, but neither of them worked at church until there was a position going for the online service producer. And uh, the husband, Tim, applied and ended up getting the job. And now Tim works here at Gateway, and he decided, you know what, Ben, I would happily give you a lift to and from work a couple of days a week when I go in. Provision, right? And I'm telling you this story because Tim owes me big time for the fact that I got broken into in 2019, because that's the reason he got a job today, so that I can get a lift to and from work. That's the whole point of the story. <laughs> so Tim, you owe me wherever you are. But that's not the point, right? At all. But you could look at that story and go, wow, what a lot of coincidences. You must be pretty lucky. Or we can look at that story and go, God provided, God provided, God provided, God provided. I'm telling you, like, this story could have just been God provided by buying us, by helping us buy two cars, right? Like, that could have been the provision. Still equally provision. 
But the question we're always left with is this, like, do we believe in coincidence or do we believe in providence? Because I read this chapter, Ruth chapter two, and I walk away believing this. Our God is a lavishly generous God. I walk away believing that he is actively at work in my life and in your life. I walk away believing that he provides for us through his people. And I also walk away believing that he invites me to be a little bit more like Boaz and be a resource of his provision to others. See, will you look at the heart of God, the nature of Jesus, even the example of Boaz, and let it stir you to respond with your own lavish generosity to those in need? to see the people around you, to see their needs, and to look for ways not just to meet it, but to go beyond it. So who do you need to notice? Is it the lonely person in your community? Is it inviting them to a party or a dinner with friends, creating an opportunity for them to build a network of people to support them? Who is it that you can protect and stand up for? Is there someone in your workplace or in your like, sporting group, like your team, who always seems to cop a bit of the raw end of the deal, always seems to be the person that people make fun of or give a hard time or pass the buck to? Are they someone that maybe instead you could take under your wing, champion, stand up for, encourage or support like Boaz does with Ruth? Or who is it that you can provide for? Maybe it's simply mowing the lawn of a neighbor who you know has had some surgery recently and can't get out and do it themselves. Or maybe it's organizing a crew of people to go and do some yard work for a family who need it. It could be simply providing for a family who needs some help paying the bills and giving them a little bit more so they don't just pay the bills, but they get to go out and have a time together as a family to bring a little bit of joy in the midst of what can be a difficult season for them. And we can do this with confidence. Knowing that, as we have just read today, that God is both simultaneously at work in your life, providing for you, and all the while asking you to be the very source of His provision in the lives of others. And we've all experienced the blessing of His provision and favor. In fact, we most likely deeply underestimate the times that God has provided for us. See, we're here this morning and we've got people joining us online from all around. And that is God's provision. It's been a provision to us by giving us, you know, cameras and people doing all the tech stuff to make it all happen. But it's God's provision to them who are joining us online too. Some of them are in remote places and difficult places to get church community. And God is providing both for us to do this, but for them through it. And we're so glad that we have these people joining us online and a part of our church community now. God's provision. We're sitting in a physical building where God provided this building and all of the people who built this building and put it all together, this is God's provision. But more than that, we've all had an answered prayer, provision, a conversation that brought wisdom, provision, a relationship that opened up a new career path, provision, a meal that someone made for us in a time of need, provision, an encouraging message when we felt like giving up, provision. All of these and more are his provision to us. Today, though, as we finish, it can be really encouraging for us sometimes when we're sitting in a great season where we're like, you know what, God has provided and life is good right now. It's great. And it can be a real encouragement for us to step out and be generous to others. But I do know that there are some people in this room this morning who probably still feel like they're in Ruth chapter one, verse 20 to 22. It feels like more has been taken than has been given. It feels like the gap is bigger than you thought it would be. You feel like actually you're not really sure about God's provision because you're in the midst of the I need you God prayers. And so what I'd love to do is to create an opportunity for those of you who are praying those prayers, to pray them with us together as a church community. There's something special in the ability to stand with one another in these moments and pray together for God to provide. And so I would love to create that opportunity that if you're here this morning and you go, I need God's provision, whether it's you just sit here and you go, I I just want to know that he sees me because it feels like he's forgotten about what's going on. I just, I want him to notice me. I want to feel that he notices me this morning. Or whether you're here and you go, I need some protection. There's some stuff going on in my family or in my friends or at my workplace. I need 
some protection this morning. I, I just want God to provide protection for us. Whether you're here and you're going, there's a big gap, and I go, God, I need you this morning. And you just want to come down the front and go, God, I need you. I need your provision. I need you to cover the gap, whatever that is, whether it's wisdom or finances or health, whatever it is, God, I need you this morning. So I'd love for us to stand where we are this morning. We're going to sing together as a church community, but we also want to gather and pray for those. So we're going to have our prayer team down the front, and I'm sure pastoral team will jump involved if they need to as well. But our prayer team are going to come down the front, and then I want to create the opportunity for you to come down the front this morning too. That if that's a prayer that you need to pray, if that's something that you're going through right now, that you would calm down the front and you would get prayer together. Remember, this is a God who is a lavish God. He wants to bless you. He wants to provide for you. He, he is already inspired to act towards you with mercy and compassion. You don't have to come down here with any hesitation or like try and, you know, like, oh God, look, I'm so sorry. Like you don't have to try and earn his attention or affection. He already has that towards you. In fact, we get to come and experience this because of His loving kindness, not to try and earn His loving kindness. And so if that's you this morning, if you know that's a prayer that you need to pray, I want you to just come out of your seat now. Just before we even start singing, just feel free to come out of your seat now. Come down to the front. The prayer team would love to pray for you this morning. If you are someone who's praying, I need you, God, prayer, and you just need people to stand with you and pray for you and pray with you for you to experience God's provision, why don't you just come down the front now? Feel free to keep coming, keep coming. The prayer team will be there and the pastoral team, I'm sure, will jump in if we need people. But hey, we're gonna sing together as well. We're gonna sing a song called The Goodness of God, which I love for this topic because it's all about how God's goodness has been with us. His faithfulness has followed us. It's been walking with us. And there's that, that key phrase in the bridge that I love where it's like, your goodness is running after me. I love that. It's like we've wandered, but God's goodness is still chasing us down. God's goodness is still coming after us. He's still good. He's still faithful all the time. And I can't wait for us to just sing this song as a declaration. Maybe things are great right now, but we get to say, I've seen and experienced the goodness of God. Maybe things are difficult at the moment. You can still get to say, I know your goodness is running after me. So why don't we sing together this morning? And if you want, come down and get prayer during the song. We'd love to pray for you. But let's sing together and declare the goodness of God together this morning. Mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your head From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful, yes, God. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God.
and your faithfulness and just how it's been running after us, chasing after us, with us all of our days. And God, we pray, Lord, that in the midst of our I need you, God, moments, we would remind ourselves of that truth, that you are a God who longs to provide for your people, who does provide and provides so abundantly. And God, I pray that you would help us in the midst of these moments, Lord, for those who have come down the front for prayer, Lord, continue to trust in your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we pray that we would see your providence in the midst of all they're going through, Lord. May you just begin to move some situations and some circumstances, Lord. Begin to provide in ways that uh, can be really tangibly seen for those who are just uh, waiting for you to move, who are feeling that gap, Lord. But I pray for the rest of us, Lord, if uh, in this moment we feel like, wow, we can sing of your goodness, Lord, I pray that we would remember that and hold on to that for those moments when we need you in the future, Lord, and, and we feel that gap extend again and we come before you and wait for your provision, Lord. Remember your goodness and your faithfulness. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We pray this in your name. Amen. We hope you've been blessed by this message. If you've made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to encourage you on your journey. Help us help you by going to gatewaybaptist.com.au and clicking on Get Connected.